in the midst of a pandemic might seem like a pretty torturous time to address maps because none of us are traveling anywhere. But that is exactly what we're going to cover in this episode. Maps. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 87 of Understanding Dark Table. I've talked briefly in the past about the maps page, but I've not done a dedicated video, and I thought it was time because there were some new features added to the maps page in version 3.4. As I'm recording this, we're now on 3.4.1. But anyway, there we go. So when you access the maps page, and that will be accessed via the other drop down from the light table view, select map, and here we are. A few things to note. On the left hand side, you will see modules that you should already be familiar with, the collect images module, the recently used collections module, and the image information module. But on the right hand side, we've got at least three modules that we've not seen before, tagging you have seen before, find location, locations, and map settings. I'm going to start with map settings. First, the show on screen display toggle will allow us to toggle off or on the navigation and zoom keys in the top left corner, the map scale in the bottom left corner, and the GPS coordinates which appear in the bottom right hand corner. Those GPS coordinates will always refer to the location that is in the very center of your map. One thing I wish existed here was the ability to simply point at an area and zoom into it, but it doesn't work like that. It always zooms into wherever your map is currently centered. Just be aware of that. If you did want to zoom into, let's say I wanted to zoom into Dubbo, what I suggest is that you look at where these triangles are on the left and right sides of your UI and these triangles at the top and bottom of your UI and try and drag that location to be in line with those triangles vertically and horizontally and then zoom in and you will end up pretty close to the mark. Okay, next up, the filtered images checkbox. If you have a current selection in the film strip at the bottom of your UI, then the filtered images will simply zoom the map to include only the images that you've currently got selected. So if I was to and this is one of the quirks, in order to only select a single image in the film strip, you need to control alt left click on the image that you want to select. If I then shift, oh, and sorry for Mac users, that would be command option click, I think. Sorry, I'm not a Mac guy. Uh, we would then shift click the last image to just select that particular range of images. If I wanted to then zoom to only where those images were, I would simply uncheck filtered and then click it again. And now my map view has zoomed in to just where those seven images are. Before we go further on that, let's just keep looking at the map settings. We can choose a map source. By default, it'll be OpenStreetMap. I personally prefer Google Maps because I do everything in Google Maps, but you can choose whichever one you like. If I uncheck filtered, we can now see all the images I've, you know, added all over the place. The group size factor will determine how many of these little groups of images appear at any one time. As you increase this, your images will compact down into larger groups. Now, what I want you to notice is these canola images, in the bottom left, there is a little number seven. These images over here, we've got 274. The canola images, that number is displayed in a white 
font, as in the the font is white, whereas this 274 is yellow. What that tells me is that these seven images are all in exactly the same location. When it's yellow, that tells me that there's 274 images that are roughly in this location. And as I zoom in on those, I will see they break apart into smaller subgroups. So wherever the text is white, all of those images, one spot. If it's yellow, as you zoom in, you'll see them break apart into different sublocations. Okay, so we can change how much those images you know basically collapse into a single group that's entirely up to you to decide minimum images per group defaults to one obviously if you want to exclude places where you only shot one image then you could increase the minimum value as you chose to so that is the map settings module Next, we've got find location. Now, unfortunately, this find location text field does not query the map that you've chosen in map source, which seems like a rather odd thing, but maybe that's to do with the API in the background. I don't know enough about that stuff. The reason I say that find location doesn't use the same map as defined in map source is because I've tried searching for locations in this find location field and they've not appeared in the search results but I can go to my Chrome browser load up Google Maps and I can find those locations. I'm currently in the midst of tagging all of the images from this road trip and the next thing I want to do is add these images which were shot just outside Tenterfield. So I am going to go Control, Alt and left click on the first image. I will then mouse along until I get to the last image in this group, which is these two of this guy burning off in his field. Shift click. Now all of those images are selected. I know this was just outside Tenterfield, so I am going to in the find location field go tenter field whoop learn to spell press enter and tenterfield shire council new south wales so it's now shown me the entire shire area of tenterfield i can see the town of tenterfield there in the middle and i know that these images were shot oh where yes just south of the town. That's right. So I can zoom in. I know it was somewhere out here on this stretch of highway. So now I just left click and drag this group and drop it where I want to. And now all of those 27 images have been given those GPS coordinates. Well, not those coordinates, just the coordinates wherever that exact point is. I can also left click and mouse wheel over the thumbnail to scroll through all of the images that were shot at that location. All right, let's move on to the locations module. What this allows us to do is define certain locations that we might want to go back to at some point in the future. So Let's say you have family who live in another particular city and you want to define that location so that you can simply left click and jump straight back to that location at any point in the future when you might want to add more images at this location. So how might I use this? Well, I can left click to deselect, left click to select, and because I've already defined this location, the circle appears with a crosshair in the middle. I can left click anywhere inside that circle to reposition the circle if I want to. And I can mouse wheel outside of the circle to zoom my map. And I can mouse wheel inside the circle to change the size of that defined location. 
If I want to just jump to a particular area that I've previously defined, just left click and I'm there. And if I don't want the overlay anymore, I can simply left click it a second time. And now I'm just back to looking at my map with no defined locations. One more thing, in the locations module, the default location shape is a circle. So if I said I wanted to create a new location, and I'll just call it test, it appears as a circle and we can do all of the usual things, change the size, move it, etc. But I can choose to make the new location a square or rectangle. So I just click on this icon until I get the rectangular shape, click on new location, I will call this test, and now I have a square. And I can use the shift key to elongate the horizontal axis, or the control key, that would be command on the Mac, to elongate the vertical axis. So if you want to define a square or a rectangle, you can do that. If I don't want that anymore, just right click and delete location. Okay, next up, I want to add the images from the Tenterfield Railway Museum. So I will control alt click the first image, scroll along till I find the last image, which is there, shift click that and click and drag and drop them where I want them. Now, if you accidentally drop a group or a single image on the map, what you can do is shift click to move an entire group like so. So I'll just put those back on the railway museum. If I accidentally included this image here in the group at the railway museum, which I didn't intend to do, what I could do is scroll wheel until I find that particular image within the group and then simply left click and drag that image away in order to reposition it where it was actually taken. Now, as it happens, I've got a whole bunch of images of this historic house. So what I could do then is control alt click the second image, find the last image, shift click, now drag and drop all of those onto that location. Now there is a bug in the current version. I don't know how long this bug has existed. I've reported it on GitHub. And that is that to remove an image from the map, theoretically, you simply left click and drag that image back to the film strip. And if it's an entire group, you shift click the group and drag it back to the film strip and release. Now, by all appearances, that has actually worked. But the moment I zoom or move my map, those images come back. That's a bug. Hopefully someone will fix it. Okay, I think that's going to do it for the map module. I think I've covered all the stuff that you need to know. Like I said, other than that bug of not being able to remove images, uh, I think everything works as anticipated. If you want to export some images from Darktable and you've added them to the map and you then decide that you don't want the GPS coordinates to be included in the export, then when you go back to the light table and you go to exported, you will need to click on the metadata cog at the bottom right hand corner of the export dialog and deselect geo tags so that the geo location data is not included in your exports. Alrighty, that's going to do it for that. But there are a few things I want to mention just on the tail end of this video before I go. I did get a comment on, oh, I don't know which video it was now, from somebody by the name of Donald Trumpoli, okay, uh, who wanted to know about the image of the tree with the stars uh, that I featured in one of the previous videos. And he said, hey, Bruce, can you show us how you shot that image? So 
in terms of the shooting, uh, this was shot on my Lauer 15mm manual focus wide angle lens. I very deliberately positioned myself so that the moon, and that is the moon right there behind the tree, uh, was on the other side of the tree from where I was so that I was in the shadow of the tree. I did that because I knew that I was going to be shooting at 30 seconds at f2.8 and that would give me all of the stars but I also knew it would give me moonlight on the landscape which would give me a little bit of just foreground detail. That's the shooting part of it. The processing part of it, it's pretty simple really. If we look at the history stack, uh, let's just collapse this because there's probably a lot of stuff there that we didn't need to see. So the first eight things here would be all of the defaults right up to white balance and actually nine things up to highlight reconstruction. Filmic RGB, uh, we can see the settings there. I don't think I even tweaked Filmic from memory. I might have adjusted the black relative position, but probably not. Uh, exposure would have been adjusted simply, you know, because it's the default that whenever you apply filmic, or certainly if you have chosen a scene ref, uh, a scene referred workflow, uh, whenever filmic is added, then exposure is added with a half stop boost. Uh, orientation is pretty much default. I added a little bit of raw denoise. I chose color balance i think i added a mask to this yes i did so i added a bit of a mask to just introduce a little bit of magenta to the star field uh, and then some local contrast which i also uh, added the curved mask to in order to uh, just limit the local contrast to the star field, just to kind of make it not look quite so flat and dull. And that's all I did, Donald. There was nothing more than that. It's not, in my opinion, a massive amount of processing, but, you know, take from it what you will. Uh, but that's all I did. Um, something else that I did want to mention before I go was... Affinity Photo. Now, I want to state right from the outset, this is not a paid endorsement. I've not been asked to promote the product. Um, the company that makes Affinity Photo, Serif, or Serif, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that. I think it's Serif. I was using their desktop publishing app, which was called Page Plus, probably 20 to 25 years ago. And I loved it. It was a great piece of software. And the company kind of, I don't know, fell out of my circle of awareness for quite some time. And then about five years ago, at a guess, maybe more, they kind of went through a bit of a, a rebranding exercise and all of their stuff got rebranded as Affinity. So they have Affinity Photo, which is their Photoshop kind of software uh, which allows you to do multi-layered editing and all that sort of stuff affinity designer which is like uh, adobe illustrator for vector image work and affinity publisher which is sort of like indesign now last year 2020 when the pandemic hit they made an announcement that they were cutting the price of their software by 50 percent which is pretty substantial. And I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. And then round new year of 2021, I got an email blast from them that said, hey, we all thought the pandemic would be over by now, but it's not. And in order to help people keep, you know, producing content, we are reintroducing this 50% discount. And I thought to myself, I wonder how much they're charging for Affinity Photo. And so I went off and looked, and it was like 38 Australian dollars. Now, you can do the 
search for yourself and find out what that equates to in your own local currency. But believe me, that is really cheap. Now, the catch is Affinity Photo is only Mac and Windows. It doesn't run natively on Linux, but I have seen people get it up and running under Wine. I tried to install Wine on my version of Linux Mint and I have had no end of grief trying to configure it. So I ended up putting VirtualBox on my Linux Mint, created an install of Windows 10, and I've now got Affinity Photo running inside a virtual environment under VirtualBox. Now, the reason I mention all of this is because I realize in the free and open source community, people generally say, if you want to do multi-layered stuff, use GIMP. And I use GIMP, I use it to create the thumbnails for these videos, and I've used it to do some other compositing work. But I've got to say, it's not even close to what Photoshop is. It's like, GIMP's down here, Photoshop's up there, Affinity Photo is up there, where GIMP's down here. It's like, it's not like 50% of the way between GIMP and Photoshop, it's like right up there. So I just wanted to mention it, just to say, while it's cheap, while it's been discounted, maybe go and have a look at it. Just something worth checking out. If you, like me, find that GIMP leaves you wanting, uh, definitely have a look at Affinity Photo. Uh, like I said, for the current pricing model, uh, I think you'd be crazy not to jump on it, but that's just my two cents. All right, guys, questions, comments, feedback, please sing out down below, and I will catch you in the next one.